Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome back. So um, this time around, I thought that I would have a, a parallel of a good tafsir, which is by uh, Tafsir al-Sadi. So while I'm reading this stuff, uh, if there's any point in time where I'd be interested to see what some of the tafsir says or to expunge on a particular subject, obviously, I think it's going to be beneficial to uh, have some scholarly work to provide some additional explanation. So if you're just joining me, then uh, yesterday I had set a goal for myself to get through the entire Quran in English for the month of Ramadan, the blessed month of Ramadan. And we finished the first juz. So now we're moving on to the second juz. And uh, I'll be reading it in English and then giving my own personal reflections on the elements that I read. Again, I just want to preface I'm not a scholar and uh, we should consult scholarship for gathering opinions. So everything that I'm reading here today is just my own personal reflections and some of the nuggets and the insights that I see. Uh, I'm also going to be posting the link to join the stream. You do have to have your camera on to have a discussion, but my primary goal really is to get through the second juz. That way that it can be of benefit to everybody, inshallah. So uh, I thank you for your patience for waiting to be called up on the stage, even though that I am going to pin the link up there for us. So that way that if there is a cue uh, as I'm reading this stuff, then I'll take the guests as they come. And then naturally, um, the chat log can also get filled up as well. So uh, if I don't get to it right away, I apologize in advance, but I'm going to try my best to pay attention. It's just that I have so many screens and stuff going on back and forth. So uh, thank you so much for your patience with me as I go through this. First and foremost, whenever you're approaching the Quran, the best practice is obviously to make ablution. So make wudu, get your intention right to seek knowledge from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, ask to be uh, protected from the accursed shaitan. So we start with, Audhu billahi minash shaitan rajim, bismillahir rahmanir rahim. So we left off at, um, this is Surah Al-Baqarah, the second juz beginning of the second juz, and it's verse 142. So it states, the foolish among the people will say, what has turned them away from their Qibla, which they used to face? Say to Allah belongs the East and the West, he guides whom he wills to a straight path. Now at this point, uh, what was happening is there was a, a change of direction in the direction of prayer. And one of the things that I know for certain is if there's ever a change in a decree, or it be it an abrogation or anything like that, that there is uh, a sense of urgency and a sense of immediacy in its um, delivery by the Prophet So parallel in the tafsir, it says that, um, uh, here's what the uh, Asadi says. So the first verse is miraculous and offers consolation and reassurance to the believers. It discusses an objection and the answer to it in three ways. It gives a description of the ones who raise this objection and a, a description of the ones who submits to the rulings and the religion of Allah. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the fools among the people are going to raise this objection. They are the ones who do not know what is good for themselves. Rather, they, they cause loss for themselves and sell their soul for the cheapest price. They are the Jews and the Christians at the time and others like them who object to the rulings and laws of Allah. The background here is that the Muslims were enjoined to face towards Beit al-Maqdis, which is in Jerusalem. And for the duration of their time in Mecca, then approximately one and a half years after the migration or the Hijrah to Medina, by his wisdom, Allah commanded them to face towards the Kaaba. So there was a change in the direction of the prayer and it was an abrogation of, of a um, previous command. Then he told them, that the fools among the people would inevitably say, what has turned them away from the Qibla, or what has turned them from the Qibla, the direction of prayer towards which they used to face, for they used to face towards Jerusalem. So what has made them turn away from it? This is an objection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ruling. So Allah, grace, and kindness. So Allah consoled the believers by telling them uh, what was going to happen and pointing out that it would only come from those who were foolish, lacking in reason, forbearance, and religious commitment. So do not pay any attention to them uh, because you know where 
this talk is coming from. The wise person pays no attention to the objection of the fools and does not worry about him. This verse indicates that no one objects to the rulings of Allah, but one who is foolish, ignorant, and stubborn. As for the wise and rational believer, he accepts the rulings of the Lord and submits to them. As Allah says, it is not fitting for any believing man or believing woman when Allah and his messenger have decided a concerning matter to have any choice in the matter. And that's in Surah Al-Ahzab. So what's happening here is <clears throat> there is a... Um, a clear understanding that if you do indeed believe that this uh, Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that this is from the Lord of the Worlds, then it would be a very, very silly thing to think that you know better, right? So Allah is creating that distinction. And one of the patterns that we saw from the previous read yesterday was uh, the type of characteristics of like arrogance, stubbornness, and all that stuff, um, uh, envious, uh, these traits of individuals that are showcasing disbelief so 143 says and thus we have made your made you a median or a just community that you will be witness over the peoples and the messenger will be a witness over you and we do not make the qibla which you used to face except that we might make evident who would follow the messenger from who would turn back on his heels and indeed it is difficult except for those whom allah has guided and never would Allah have caused you to lose your faith, uh, which is your previous prayers. Indeed, Allah is to the people kind and merciful. So once again, we have a distinction of kindness. We have a distinction of mercy. And um, we have a decree that came down. And this is to show the separation of the people that are truly believing in regards to the ones that are uh, hypocritical or faking it. Because remember, there was a, a huge touch on the hypocrites and their characteristics a little bit earlier. Uh, we have, uh, 144 goes, we have certainly seen the turning of your face, O Muhammad, towards the heaven, and we will surely turn you to a qibla, which uh, you will be pleased. So turn your face, uh, which is yourself, your body, towards al-Masjid al-Haram. And wherever you believers are, turn your faces or yourselves towards it in prayer. Indeed, those who have been given the scripture, which is the Jews and the Christians, well know that it is the truth from their Lord, and Allah is not unaware of what they do. So once again, there is uh, that particular reminder, and there is a, a fantastic connection here between our beloved uh, Prophet وسلم, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that there was supplications and there was a yearning to actually go towards and face the um, Qibla, towards Masjid al-Haram which is a very beautiful thing, right? And it's just, again, a, a, a massive show of mercy uh, between Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation. And if you brought to those, 140, 145 goes, and if you brought to those who were given the scripture every sign and they would not follow your qibla, and excuse me, it reads, and if you brought to those who were given the scripture every sign, they would not follow your qibla, nor will you be a follower of their qibla, nor would they be followers of one another's qibla. So if you were to follow their desires after what has come to you of knowledge, indeed, you would then be among the wrongdoers. It kind of reminds me of, you know, um, you know, Lekum Dinukum uh, which is, uh, there's a, a surah way towards the, the um, tail end of the Quran, uh, which is basically like you're, Way be your way and uh, my way be mine and there's not going to be any following in between so uh those to whom we 146 reads those to whom we gave the scripture know him which is the prophet muhammad وسلم, and they know their own sons but indeed a party of them conceal the truth while they know it so this is uh, a big 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 thing within people internally especially when we're in the field of dawah um, people see the truth, it's evident, but it's a really tough pill to swallow. And one of the things that we touched up on on the last stream was when you're talking to somebody about their belief, you have to be very respectful to um, where they're at in their journey because you're, you're basically coming up to them as a nobody and you're saying, hey, um, there is a, a huge chance, especially if they're non-Muslim, uh, that everything that you've been taught is, is a complete lie. And now you're shaking their entire foundation. These people, you have to level with them and, you know, uh, give them the message in a very nice and gentle way. You can't just be like, hey, look at you and look at me. You know what I'm saying? 
So it's you're you're challenging everything that they know in regards to their the purpose of their existence, their connectivity and their connection to God and all that stuff. And it gets very sensitive. So if you're ever talking to somebody about religion, be extremely respectful of their um, current situation and their current position. OK. The truth is from your Lord, so never be among the doubters. For each religious following is a prayer direction towards which it faces. So, so race to all that is good. Wherever you may be, Allah will bring you forth for judgment altogether. Indeed, Allah is over all things competent. So from wherever you go out for prayer, O Muhammad, وسلم, turn your face towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And indeed, it is the truth from your Lord. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. And from wherever you go out for prayer, turn your face towards Al-Masjid Al-Haram. And wherever you believers may be, turn your faces towards it in order that the people will not have any argument against you except for those of them who commit wrong. So fear them not, but fear me. And it is so I may complete my favor upon uh, you and that you may be guided. Oftentimes when people are um, taking a first glance at Islam, there is a uh, high chance that they think that people that are Muslim, they worship some, you know, black stone or this cube in the middle of the Saudi Arabian desert kind of thing. That's not the case at all. It's purely just a direction for prayer. And it shows a sense of unification uh, that uh, all of us uh, are uh, equal um, given our racial backgrounds and all that other stuff. But rather, it's about the piety and uh, the status with our Lord, right? So this unification, this direction of prayer, uh, makes sure that there's no disagreements on which way people are supposed to face. So oftentimes, uh, especially in the Taoist scene, you'll see like these doctored photos of like people facing all sorts of different ways. And it's just so silly. If anybody were just to pick up a copy of the Quran and go through it, just like we are, um, you'll see the beauty, beauty in this type of unification. And I remember specifically when I was visiting Mecca, when I was visiting Medina, there's so many colorful backgrounds of people that are next to you from uh, Asian, black, white, um, you know, you name it, it, they're there. And it's such a beautiful sight to see uh, where you have all these people in a state of worship, all these different cultures, all these different languages. It's something that I've never seen anywhere in the world other than there. Uh, just as, so it carries, uh, Las Penta carries on, just as we have sent among you a messenger from yourselves, reciting to you our verses and purifying you and teaching you the book and wisdom and teaching you that which you did not know. So remember me and I will remember you and be grateful to me and do not deny me. O oh, you who have believed, so this is talking to the people that have believed, seek help through patience and prayer. Indeed, Allah is with the patient. And do not say about those who are killed in the way of Allah, they are dead. Rather, they are alive, but you perceive it not. And this is actually a very powerful statement, because, especially with the relevance of today. Um, so this is, uh, you can see this visibly on what's happening right now in, with our brothers and sisters all across the world that are being oppressed um, from the Uyghurs to the people in Palestine. Uh, they are they are literally an embodiment of alhamdulillah when you look at them they're just so cheerful they're so happy with every every single small grain of flour that that they have um, been given every rainfall and this is really the state that we should uh, try our best to get to um, because oftentimes we forget this stuff when we're so busy with our lives and um, this is a really healthy reminder, especially for the ones that have passed away. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has summoned back to them. Uh, so they are very much so alive indeed. Um, also, just another kind of key takeaway here. A lot of times there's a, an argument from a Christian standpoint saying that, oh, well, you know, Jesus is alive, but your prophet is dead. You know, um, he, he is in a state of barzakh. So he has transitioned over to the other realm. And uh, he is very much so alive. He is not uh, dead in a spiritual sense. Uh, he has, his body has been buried right in this world, but uh, in a spiritual sense, he's very, very much so alive. And likewise, that state of Basel is waiting for us uh, when we pass away. Okay. 
and we will surely test you with something of fear and hunger and a loss of wealth and lives and fruits, but give good tidings to the patient. So again, it's a reminder from a lost path out that life is about ebbs and flows. It's about tests. It's about having ups and it's about having downs. And I know the prophet said that a believer has really true states, one of shukr and one of sabr, right? So meaning the shukr is the, the believer is very, very grateful. And when they're going through a trial, they're very, very patient. Okay. Uh, who, when disaster strikes them, say, indeed, we belong to Allah, and indeed to him we will return. Those are the ones upon whom are blessings from their Lord and mercy, and it is those who are the rightly guided. Indeed, a Sefa and a Marwa are among the symbols of Allah. So whoever makes Hajj, which is pilgrimage to the house of, or performs Umrah, there is no blame upon him for walking between them and whoever volunteers good and indeed Allah is appreciative and knowing so he's encouraging uh, uh, he's encouraging good he's encouraging to uh, volunteer and I'm going to share something very very personal with you guys on my first trip to Umrah on my first trip to Umrah uh, Alhamdulillah I had the the very um, big fortune of going with a friend who is a Hafiz. So he was someone who memorized the Quran entirely. And again, at, at this point, um, my Iman was good, but I would say that just like anybody, there's room for improvement in your faith. And as I was making Tawaf with him, um, we were up on the upper levels. So there's multiple levels. Uh, and when, I, when you're in the upstairs level, there's usually these um, volunteers that are helping people, uh, especially the elderly. They usually are holding wheelchairs and they're pushing these uh, wheelchairs. And subhanAllah, I was looking at one of the elderly people and a thought ran through my mind and the thought was, man, I feel really bad for this individual because he is so old, but he's still working. And I wish I could do something to help him, you know, either reach retirement or something like that. You know what I mean? And the second that that thought ran through my mind, the second that the thought ran through my mind, wallahi, you guys can hold me to, to account on this on the day of judgment. My friend turns to me and goes, Morris, aren't these people so blessed? Look at him in his old age, and he's conducting tawaf around the Kaaba, and not only for himself, but he's helping someone else. And I straight up looked at him, and I was like, I gave him an immediate hug, and I was like, you're not going to believe me when I tell you this, but I was thinking the exact opposite. I'm so glad that you said that out loud, because um, I was feeling really kind of bad, and I should have been feeling joyful. So you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives these types of moments, and I was blessed with that moment, especially um, during Umrah. Okay. Uh, indeed, those who conceal what we sent down of clear proofs and guidance after we made it clear for the people in the scripture, those are cursed by Allah and cursed by those who curse. So uh, we have, again, a reference to concealment and a reference to um, the... Uh, alteration of scriptures, which was previously mentioned in the chapter as well. And now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they're, they're, they're cursed by Allah and, and those who curse. And I would um, associate that with uh, angels as well as people that have made dua against these types of people uh, where they have used their hands for bad in order to misguide others. Except for those who repent and correct themselves and make evident what they concealed. Those I will accept their repentance. I will accept their repentance, and I am the accepting of repentance, the merciful. So again, we have a state, we have a condition of an individual where they have gone through trial and they may have concealed something, and they thought that they could conceal it from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they're harboring some type of pain within themselves, and eventually they repented, right? They came clean. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala seems that He is constantly leaving doors open for people. So this is why when we talk to people. Uh, uh, in the Dawah scene, and when we're telling them about Islam, and if they are in a state of hopelessness, um, this is a really bad state to be in. Rather, you should always be hopeful of your Creator because He is the oft forgiving, the most forgiving. And that is a beautiful thing to me that that avenue is always open. Indeed, those who disbelieve and die while they are disbelievers, upon them will be the curse of Allah and of the angels and the people altogether. So now my takeaway from this is I genuinely feel that people have 
innumerable amounts of nudges that are given to them by a lost pound data, like absolutely innumerable amounts. And I think that those nudges are relevant to their own personal situations. With that being said, if you die in a state of that disbelief, um, you really have nobody to blame but yourself, right? Abiding eternal. And, and, and by the way, when I, I preface that and I say that you, you will have uh, an opportunity to present your case on the day of judgment. And when everything is put forward and people will see exactly what the deal is, um, they will see exactly what the deal is of how many times that you actually receive those nudges and you yourself will see it. I don't think that your case is going to be very, very strong. Okay. Uh, carrying on abiding eternally therein, the punishment will not be lightened for them, nor will they be reprieved. And your God is one God. There is no deity worthy of worship except him, the entirely merciful, the especially merciful. So there again is that Tawheed element, which is so critical um, in Islam. Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alteration of the night and the day and the great ships which sail through the sea, which uh, with that which benefits people and what Allah has sent down from the heavens of, of rain, giving life hereby to the earth after its lifelessness and dispersing therein every kind of moving creature and his direction of the winds and the clouds controlled between the heavens and the earth are signs for people who use reason. So here we go. Um, this is a beautiful, a beautiful statement in the Quran. If you guys aren't familiar, you know, we build these like wild ships with all these crazy technologies and these GPS systems and all these stabilizing, um, stabilizer engineering and all this other stuff. But with the winds are like at 10 knots, these ships can't dock. Like they can't sail. And the, this is just like 10 knots, right? Uh, and then for this, you know, for the fact that it mentions that it, we're carrying these types of provisions, right? Meaning our major modus of carrying, you know, all sorts of food and everything, cars, parts, you name it, is on ships, like on vessels. I mean, look at what happened when like the Suez Canal was gridlocked, right? It, commerce just went bananas okay and then again Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that he's dispersing the rain and when it's lifeless um it, the land being lifeless it gives life to the land and if you pay close attention to the seasons you'll see how things go from like a green to a yellow to you know all like barren and the first droplets of rain have to soften the ground. And then it's only like the continual rains, which helps with the harvest. Um, and that, that whole process, the whole um, idea of topsoil and how that stuff works in regards to gathering our fruits and harvesting and stuff. It's just a very magnificent thing. And yet among the people are those who take other than Allah as equals to him. They love them as they should love Allah. But those who believe are stronger in love for Allah, and if only they who have wronged would consider that they see the punishment, uh, when they see the punishment, they will be certain that all the power belongs to Allah and that Allah is severe in punishment. So now to me, this is, you know, there's going to be various degrees of punishment. It's not like uh, it's like a one size fits all situation. And I think that the people, um, the people that come about and take such like a hard-headed stance against the loss of Allah and commit all these atrocities that we're seeing on a daily basis, these are the ones that are going to have the most severe types of punishment. Because obviously, if they were to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they would have a, um, a guideline on how to conduct themselves. And since they're choosing to disbelieve, they're choosing to disbelieve in the guidelines set forth in you know, boom, there you have it. They're going to be the ones that are committing all the major atrocities. So it's only befitting that the punishment is suitable and, and severe for them. Uh, and they should consider that, 166 says, and they should consider that when those who have been followed disassociate themselves from those who follow them, and they all see the punishment and cut, and cut off from them are the ties of relationship. Now, interestingly here, 
obviously a lost pantan is uh, giving us a, a forecast of what's going to happen on the day of judgment. But interestingly, think about what happens to people that you may know right now that have kind of like a bullyish mentality or a liar type mentality. When they get caught, nobody wants to hang out with them. Nobody wants to be associated with them, especially in like dirty games like politics and stuff like that. It's it's so true that immediately, immediately, all of their relationships, they just push them at like an arm's length now. They just, they don't want to be identified with the troublemaker. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that uh, no one's going to be there for you, especially the people that you used to hold dear to. Um, that you used to rely on or depend upon. I mean, heck, I can even think of certain presidential candidates right now in the United States. You know, their lawyers are falling apart. Their cases are falling apart. Their bills are coming due. They're running out of money. Their following is falling apart. It's the same situation from all tiers of leadership. Okay, those who follow will say, if only we had another turn at the worldly life, so we could disassociate ourselves from them as they have disassociated themselves from us. Thus will Allah show them their deeds as regrets upon, uh, upon them, and they will never, uh, and they are never to emerge from the fire. So if you're following someone blindly, and if you're not utilizing your own critical thinking to come to your own conclusions, and you turn and point a finger at that person that you're following, you're going to be in deep, especially if that person is upon falsehood. Naturally, we follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we follow the Prophet, and we believe that we're upon truth. So we have nothing to worry about. But this is specifically talking about those people that are following the wrongdoers, the evildoers. O oh, mankind, eat from whatever it is, whatever is on the earth that is lawful and good, and do not follow the footsteps of Satan. Indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. So obviously we have prescriptions on what we can and cannot eat and it has to be lawful and it has to be good. So it's not just about, or at least my takeaway from this is it's not just about eating halal meat. You don't have to eat meat every single day. You can eat it once a week, you can eat it once a month. Um, you should be eating the nutritious compounds that your body needs because your body has a right over you, right? It's a, it is a, gift that was given to you by the creator and if you misuse this gift um, eventually you're going to have to answer for that right uh, he only orders you to evil so it's talking about uh, satan here he only orders you to evil and immorality and to say about allah what you do not know so when you see people following conjecture or you see people uh, that are upon uncertainty this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you. The, the inspiration, the insights that you're getting are purely from shaitan or Satan, which again is your enemy. And when it is said to them, follow what Allah has revealed, they say, rather, we will follow that which we have found our fathers doing, even though their fathers understood nothing, nor were they guided. Now, here's the deal. When I talk to people, especially when, you're, when I'm out on the streets, it's very easy to be socially conditioned towards something. And the first people that are going to condition you socially are your parents. And wallahi, you can see people when they're walking by, especially as a family, you can see it from their dress to their demeanor to how they conduct themselves. This is, it, it, you, you know, like the old saying, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, is referencing here uh, based on my own personal reflection. That they're following their forefathers, not only in lifestyle, but also in their understanding of the here and now, as well as the hereafter. And this is dangerous. And this is one thing that separates Islam from other religions, because it constantly encourages you to think. The example of those who disbelieve is like that of one who shouts at what hears nothing but calls and cries like cattle or sheep, deaf, dumb, and blind, so they do not understand. Meaning that if they're following conjecture and they think that they're upon some type of evidence or they think that they're upon some type of truth, but they can't give you an, ex an exact example for this truth, it's just speaking a bunch of hollow terms. They're not certain. They're not certain themselves, so they can't project that certainty. The only 
a thing that can project that certainty is the source of certainty itself, the ultimate reality, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's exactly what the Quran does. O oh, you who have believed, eat from the good, uh, for example, lawful things which we have provided for you and be grateful to Allah if it is indeed him that you worship. He has only forbidden to you dead animals, blood, the flesh of swine, and that which has been dedicated to other than Allah. But whoever is forced by necessity, neither desiring it nor transgressing its limits, there is no sin upon him. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. And again, this is the beauty of Islam. Yes, you have restrictions, right? You have restrictions in this world. And everything, alhamdulillah, does serve a purpose. But not everything has to serve the purpose of creating sustenance for you. It's as simple as that. Just like when I tell, when I say that if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts a restriction on something, it's because there's benefit in it for you. If you were to look, for example, uh, if you were to look at the flesh of swine, these uh, creatures are meant to clean the earth. They eat absolutely everything and anything from fecal matter, death, decay, blood, their own young. You, I mean, you name it. They literally are just cleaners of the earth. Okay. Furthermore, their digestive tract does not fully digest stuff and it secretes it through their flesh. So when you consume this flesh, you get bacteria that you should not be uh, consuming. Another thing about pigs in particular or swine in particular is they have a, a, a portion in their brain which lights up when they see their mate have sex with another swine. Okay. So there, there's just things that you want to stay away from. You just genuinely want to stay away from it. And it's not that hard. A lot of people, especially when I talk to, um, you know, my neighbors, right? They're like, oh man, you've never tried bacon. No, I've tried bacon. And alhamdulillah, now that I went over to Islam, you can have beef bacon. It's just a belly cut. That's all that it is. It's just a belly cut of meat. And then they go, oh, there's beef bacon. Yeah, there is beef bacon, man. And it tastes amazing. It's just, you're not missing out on anything, anything if you were to dump, uh, if you were to dump swine as food, okay? Uh, and then the other thing that I want to touch up on here is if it's forced by necessity, meaning if you're put into a situation where you're going to starve or you're going to be, or you're going to harm yourself in some way, then obviously this impermissibility is restricted from you until you regain the ability to um, provide for yourself in a halal way. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go out there and purchase, uh, you know, uh, pork product because it's cheaper than beef product. No, because you can find an alternate solution, such as not eating any meat at all. Um, it's actually talking about a life or death situation. And again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us that indeed he is forgiving and merciful. So he's going to know what your intention is. If your intention is, is to try the flavor of the meat and to try to disobey for the purposes of just disobeying versus trying to actually survive. Um, indeed, they who conceal what Allah has sent down of the book and exchange it for a small price, those consume not into their bellies except the fire. And Allah will not speak to them on the day of resurrection, nor will he purify them, and they will have a painful punishment. So once again, we have a reinforcement on the previous scriptures being corrupted. At this point, it's either at like, I, I believe, four or five times that it's specifically mentioned and that they're exchanging it for a small price and all the luxuries and stuff like that that they're consuming this is exactly the same thing that's gonna that's gonna come back to bite them those are the ones who have exchanged guidance for error and forgiveness for punishment so again it's transactional they exchanged it how patient they are for in pursuit of the fire so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying basically take all the time that you need because um, you've, you've made a terrible, terrible transaction and uh, you think that there's nothing coming after you um, and he can wait forever, right? So that is deserved by them because Allah has sent down the book in truth. And indeed, those who differ over the book are an extreme dissension. So a couple of things here. First and foremost, he tells you plainly, they deserve this, right? They're not, there's not going to be unjust punishment or unjust cause. And then secondly, um, those who differ over the book are in extreme dissension. So you've gone 
far, far away from where you're supposed to be. Far from you've descended massively, massively. Righteousness is not that you turn your faces towards the east or the west, but true righteousness is in one who believes in Allah, the last day, the angels, the book, and the prophets, and gives wealth in spite of love for it to relatives, orphans, the needy, the traveler, those who ask for help and for freeing slaves, and who establish prayer and give zakat, those who fulfill their promise when they and when they promise, uh, excuse me, those who fulfill their promise when they promise, and those who are patient in poverty and hardship and during battle, those are the ones who have been true, and it is those who are the righteous. Okay, subhanAllah. Just yesterday, right, there was a Rob that was on the stream and he said he couldn't find anything beautiful. How could you not read this 177 verse 177 and say that this is not a beautiful thing? How could you not? I mean, it's it's as clear as day. Oh, you who have believed prescribed for you is legal retribution for those murdered. The free, uh, uh, the free for, for the free, the slave for the slave, and the female for the female. But whoever overtook, uh, overlooks from his brother, which is the killer in this case, anything, then there should be a suitable follow-up and a payment to him. Uh, for example, the deceased's heir or legal representative with good conduct. This is an alleviation from your Lord and a mercy, but whoever transgresses after that will be a painful, there will be a painful to, uh, punishment. And there is for you in legal retribution, saving of life. O oh, you people of understanding that you may become righteous. Prescribe for you when death approaches any one of you, if he leaves wealth, is that he should make a bequest for the parents and near relatives, according to what is acceptable, a duty upon the righteous. So what's amazing to me is this is, this is remember, this is a life playbook, right? So there are situations where you're going to be faced with either you have the right to compensation or you have the right to exercise forgiveness. And Islam encourages the forgiveness route, but you also are, and your reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you also have the right for just compensation. So it's basically an eye for an eye, okay? But mercy is the encouraged path. Forgiveness is the encouraged path in Islam. And then, um, just like a playbook, there is also prescriptions on what to do in regards to uh, inheritances so uh, then um, there is a step-by-step -step process, a due process in order to take care of relatives, in order to take care of the people that are closest to you. And it reads, then whoever alters the bequest after he has heard it, the sin is only upon those who have altered it. Indeed, Allah is all hearing and all knowing. Now imagine a situation if someone extremely wealthy passes away. Everybody wants a piece of the pie, right? And especially, um, you know, there's a, a process here in the United States, which is called probate. And when somebody passes away, if they don't have a, a trust set up with an attorney and, and they don't have their will within that trust, anybody can challenge their estate. Anybody. Um, I know that there was a, uh, there was a lot of famous musicians. I want to say this was um, Chick Corea. He was a jazz musician. And um, his probate lasted like something like 20 years. And one of his uh, um, uh, maids like that would clean his house challenged the probate and like got a bunch of money, right? Saying like, oh yeah, you know, we used to kind of hang out and we had this like love relationship and this, that, and the third. And it's just, you know, subhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that these people that go in and try to pluck some of the inheritances and stuff and get into changing these types of um, bequests and whatnot, they're going to get in trouble. You, you can get away with it maybe in this world, but not in the next. But if one fears from the bequeather some error or sin and corrects that which is between them, uh, i.e. the concerned parties, there is no sin upon them. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. Again, take the path of justice correct the mistakes, 
find the errors and there's no sin upon you. As a matter of fact, there's a reward. O oh, you who have believed, decreed upon you is fasting. Here we are in the month of Ramadan. As it was decreed upon those before you that you may become righteous. So one of the tickets, one of the qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for is for people to be righteous. And one of the methods on how to obtain this quality is fasting. And, you know, subhanAllah, um, you know, uh, I was just kind of, uh, I was having a conversation uh, with one of my family members and uh, she had said that um, she saw a video of a non-Muslim saying, you know what, I am going to, uh, I'm going to fast the month of Ramadan. So it's non-Muslim. I'm going to fast the month of Ramadan, not because um, uh, I want to diet, but rather because I see that consumerism has plagued my community and it's also plagued my mentality. And she said, I want to fast the month of Ramadan because I do not want to be plagued with consumerism. So subhanAllah, what an insight. If you fast from food along with technology, along with seeing vile things and speaking vile language, how on earth would you not become righteous? How on earth would you not become righteous? Okay. Uh, fasting for a limited number of days. So whoever among you is ill or on a journey during, during them, which is the fasting days, then an equal number of those days are to be made up. And upon those who are able to fast, but with hardship, a ransom is a substitute of feeding a poor person each day. And whoever volunteers good in excess, uh, for example, excess work, it is better for him, but to fast is best for you, if only you knew. So there, again, this is the mercy of Islam. You have the, you have the obligation of fasting, but... If you are somebody who is on a journey, okay, or if you are somebody who is experiencing a medical hardship, okay, or uh, uh, let me recap this really quickly. It says, upon those who are, who are able, so, or somebody who is unable for whatever reason, be it medical or be it some, some type of, you know, a shortcoming, um, you know, maybe there's a handicap of some sort, right? then there is a, a mercy that is granted to you. So you can now go feed the poor as a substitute. You can also conduct excess volunteer work. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it's better. It's better to fast, right? It's better to fast. So don't use it as like a cop out, right? The month of Ramadan, alhamdulillah, we're here is that in which was revealed the Qur'an, a guidance for the people and, a cl and clear proofs of guidance and criterion. So who, whoever cites the crescent moon, uh, uh, the crescent of the month, let them fast it. And whoever is ill or on a journey, then an equal number of, the, uh, of other days. Allah intends for you ease and does not intend for you hardship and wants for you to compete, uh, complete the period and to glorify Allah for that to which he has guided you and perhaps you will be grateful the Quran came down Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided you to this Quran and then here he is again Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim the most merciful the most generous the oft forgiving okay here is Allah's intent he intends ease for you he is himself saying it I intend ease for you and not hardship, okay, not hardship, because he has guided you so that you could be grateful. And this concept of taqwa, which is basically being, being God conscious, you start recognizing just how much of a blessing it is to have a cold drink of water. You start recognizing how much of a blessing it is to um, have a peaceful night's sleep, okay, because there's people out in the world right now that have bombs being thrown on them. They have no, no, no peace whatsoever. They have no food. They have no water. These are all the people that are oppressed from every nation that's being oppressed, including the things that are in the spotlight today. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all those uh, and grant them uh, a swift victory over their oppressors. Amin. Okay. And when my servants uh, ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, indeed, I am near. 
I respond to the invocation of the supplicant when he calls upon me. So let them respond to me by obedience and believe in me that they might be rightly guided. If you're making a supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you're going to get a response. And here's the deal. From an Islamic point of view, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never says no. He says, yes, yes, but not now, or I have something better. Period. Now, whether or not you receive what you're looking for, that's a yes. Whether you receive what you're looking for later, that's yes, but not now. Okay? And I have something better is both in this world and in the afterworld, in the afterlife. If you did not receive what you were looking for in this world, inshallah, you will um, receive that award on the day of judgment and in the hereafter where it's going to be everlasting. So, for example, I know lots of brothers and sisters that are, you know, they're trying to have children. Okay. And they're not receiving that type of reward in this world. But in the hereafter, they may receive it. So it's either going to be yes, yes, but not now, or I have something better. Uh, so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for everybody that's going through a trial. All right, 187. It's been, uh, it has been made permissible for you the night preceding the fast, uh, night preceding fasting to go to your wives for uh, sexual relations. They are a clothing for you and you are a clothing for them. Allah knows that you, that you used to deceive yourselves. So he accepted your repentance and forgave you. So now have relations with them and seek that which, uh, that which Allah has decreed for you, which is offspring, and eat and drink until the white thread of dawn becomes distinct to you from the black thread of the night. Then complete the fast until the night, which is sunset, and do not have relations with them as long as you are staying for worship in the mosques. These are the limits set by Allah. So do not approach them. Thus does Allah make clear his verses, which are the ordinances, to the people that they may become righteous. So here's the deal. There's again an easing. There's an easing that is going on here uh, for the folks that are married um, and, and following the, the Quran and Sunnah. There's an easing that you can approach your wives and your husbands and you can have relations with them at night. But here's the deal. There's limits. Naturally, when you're in a state of ibadah, when you're in a state of worship, such as fasting or haram, when you're going and conducting uh, umrah or any type of hajj, there's limits on what you can and cannot do. It just so happens that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his infinite wisdom is telling you, look, you're in, a, you're in a process of fasting. And I understand that you're going to get urges, but you have to maintain your limits until the night time, the same way that you're maintaining your limits with food and water. Otherwise, you're just going to have empty bellies and be hungry and you're not going to understand self-control, right? Because you're fasting, including fasting of technology and uh, all other sources of, of distractions. And, and do not consume one another's wealth unjustly or send it in bribery to the rulers in order that they might aid you to consume a portion of the wealth of the people in sin. While you know it is unlawful, they ask you, O Muhammad, about the crescent moons. Say they are measurements of time for the people and for Hajj pilgrimage. And it is not righteousness, uh, it is not righteousness to enter houses from the back, but righteousness is in one who fears Allah and enters the house from their doors and fear Allah that you may succeed. So a couple things here. First and foremost, consuming wealth unjustly. There is a, a huge thing in regards to inheritance, okay, especially if somebody were to, um, it's very common here in the United States for people to have things like life insurance, right? And you need to consult a scholar on whether or not you should get that. I'm not making any type of endorsements for that. Rather, when something like an inheritance happens, um, the wealth is typically squandered. It is typically squandered in pish posh stuff and, and useless things. Um, and it is not a benefit to the person, especially because it, uh, when it's something unexpected and they're dealing with a massive grief or a massive trauma, it's very easily to become emotionally consumed. And you're going to want to utilize that wealth for the purposes of bettering yourself mentally, okay? Um, and in regards to the moon phases, a long time ago, we switched over to the Gregorian calendar, but if we stuck through with the lunar calendar, 
Uh, we wouldn't have to do any of this silly daylight savings time. There would be no months that had 28 days and some and, and others that had 31 days. This is all Shaitan playing with the concept of time. If we just stuck to the lunar calendar uh, by the decree that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us to judge time, we would have none of these problems. None of them. Okay. So uh, carrying on, fight in the way of Allah those who fight against you, but do not transgress. Indeed, Allah does not like the transgressors. And kill them in battle wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. And fitna is worse than killing. And do not fight them at al-Masjid al-Haram until they fight you, uh, until they fight you there. But if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. So here, Subhanallah, uh, we have some of the first verses in regards to self-defense and fighting fi sabilillah, right? Um, so when it comes to uh, the laying down of this verse, notice exactly how it's put down and kill them in battle wherever you overtake them and expel them from wherever they have expelled you. So it is a reactionary thing. You were the one that was first expelled. So expel them from where they have expelled you. Uh, and fitna is worse than killing, right? Meaning that trial that the, um, th the idea of causing this type of uh, internal turmoil is, is far worse than killing because of a generational thing. It can have reverberating effects, okay? And do not fight them at Masjid al-Haram until they fight you there. So you have sanctuaries that are forbidden and you cannot fight until they fight you. But if, but if they fight you, then kill them. Such is the recompense of the disbelievers. So again, he's sandwiching it again. If they fight you, then fight back. Uh, and if they cease, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. So if they stop, you're trying to incline towards the end of something. You're not trying to just perpetuate the, the, um, the uh, unnecessary killing or anything to that extent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is setting a limit. If they cease, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. Fight them until there is no more fitna and until religion, i.e. worship, is acknowledged to be for Allah. But if they cease, then there is to be no aggression i.e. assault, except against the oppressors. So you're supposed to fight until the religion is, is restored, meaning, meaning that there is a limit that is placed. Uh, and if they cease, then there is to be no aggression. So you cannot compel them towards Islam. Rather, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, again, my own personal extraction from this, and I'm happy to read the tafsir on this from a scholar. Um, but my own personal extraction is the ruling sharia, the ruling law is supposed to be the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Meaning if the Muslims regain power in a particular area, the fighting is to cease. And there is to be no aggression. Because if the Muslims are the dominant power, now they would be considered the aggressors. So if the region or the area were to be stabilized, um, then the only, uh, it, it, that's it, there's a cease, but uh, there's to be no aggression except against the oppressors. So if there's key targets that they know that are going to start trouble again, you have the ability to approach these key targets and do what's necessary. Battle in the sacred month is for aggression committed in the sacred month and for all violations is legal retribution. So whoever has assaulted you, then assault him in the same way that he has assaulted you and fear Allah and know that Allah is with those who fear him. Again, it's a reactionary, it's a, it's a consequence. Assault those who have assaulted you. Okay. And spend in the way of Allah and do not throw yourselves with your own hands into destruction. Again, you're going to reap what you sow by refraining. So if you're miserly, you're, you're missing out. You're missing out on a massive amount of forgiveness. You're missing out on the purification of your wealth. And you're missing out on the building of, of good habits. And do good. Indeed, Allah loves the doers of good. 
and a loss panata that gives us criteria on on what exactly is good and what exactly is bad, right? And complete the Hajj and Umrah for Allah. But if you are prevented, then offer what you can be what can be obtained with ease of sacrificial animals. So again, if you're in a position where you can barely afford a date and you can offer this date, this could be worth more than mountains on the day of judgment because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your exact conditions. And do not shave your head until the sacrificial animal has reached its place, its place of slaughter. And whoever among you is ill or has an ailment of the head, make shaving necessary, must offer a ransom of fasting three days or charity or sacrifice. And when you are secure, when whoever performs Umrah during the Hajj months, followed by Hajj, offers what can be obtained with ease of sacrificial animals. And whoever cannot find or afford such an animal, then fast, then a fast of three days during Hajj and of seven when you have returned home. Those are 10 complete days. This is for those whose family is not in the area of al-Masjid al-Haram and fear Allah and know that Allah is severe in penalty. So subhanAllah, if you're in a, in a position where you can't um, oblige the sacrificial animal, no problem. You can take uh, the extra benefit of fasting and uh, reap the rewards uh, that way. Hajj is during well-known months so whoever has made Hajj obligatory upon himself therein by entering the state of Ihram, there is to be for him no sexual relations and no disobedience and no disputing during Hajj. And whatever good you do, Allah knows it and take provisions. But indeed, the best provision is fear of Allah and fear me, O you of understanding. Again, a very, very... Uh, merciful position in a sense that you have limitations, you have to respect yourself, and you have to respect the condition that you're entering, you have to respect the sanctity of what you're doing, and keep your thoughts pure, and remember and love and fear Allah, uh, if you have any understanding. There is no blame upon you for seeking bounty from your Lord during Hajj. But when you depart from Arafat, remember Allah uh, remember Allah at Al-Masjid uh, 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 al Al-Haram and remember him as he has guided you for indeed you were before that among those astray. So obviously from an Islamic perspective, we believe that you're at the Masjid Al-Haram by invitation. It's not based on how much money you have, but rather it's the, the invitation of having that be written for you in your lifespan so that you can go visit uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's sacred house. Then depart from the place from where all the people depart and ask forgiveness of Allah. Indeed, Allah is forgiving and merciful. And when you have completed your rites, remember Allah like your previous remembrance of your fathers or with much greater remembrance. And among the people is he who says, Our Lord, give us in this world, and he will have in the hereafter no share. But among them is he who says, Our Lord, give us in this world that which is good and in the hereafter that which is good and protect us from the punishment of the fire. I mean, and I had mentioned this last time. Last time I had mentioned that when you see a dua like this, this is, you know, this is literally a key that was given to you, a golden nugget that was given to you by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a dua, our Lord, give us in this world that which is good and in the hereafter that which is good and protect us from the punishment of the fire. How much more beautiful um, can it get than that? Those uh, will have a share of what they have earned and Allah is swift in account. And remember Allah during specific uh, numbered days, then whoever hastens his departure in two days, there is no sin upon him. And whoever delays until the third, there is no sin upon him. For him who fears Allah and fear Allah and know that unto him you will be gathered. And of the people is he whose speech pleases you in worldly life. And he calls Allah to witness as to what is in his heart. Yet he is the fiercest of opponents. So here we have people um, 
that are labeled as hypocrites once again. So you have these smooth talkers and people that are uh, eloquent in their speech, and they actually call you to Allah. Uh, but um, what's in his heart is completely different. And when he goes away, he strives throughout the land to cause corruption therein and destroys crops and animals. And Allah does not like corruption. So there you have it. Anybody that's causing any type of corruption, especially against the decrees of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his creation, such as this planet and his uh, creation, mankind and his creation, animals and insects and everything. And you're spreading this type of corruption. He doesn't like you. He really just doesn't like you straight up. Okay. And when it's said to him, fear Allah, pride in the sin takes hold of him. Sufficient for him is hellfire. And how wretched is the resting place. So here we have another key characteristic, pride. Okay. So we had envy. We had pride. We had uh, defiance. We had um, arrogance. These are all key characteristics so far that we have come across. And all these key characteristics lead to disbelief. And they all lead to uh, corruption. And of the people is he who sells himself, seeking means to the approval of Allah. And Allah is kind to his servants. Uh, o oh, you who have believed. So it's addressing the people who have believed. Enter into Islam completely and perfectly and do not follow the footsteps of Satan. Indeed, he is to you a clear enemy. So it's, it's saying, look, it's, it's as clear as day. These verses, these signs are clear as day. And you, you believed before, and now that a new messenger has come, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting you again. But if you slip up, uh, which is to deviate after clear proofs have come to you, then know that Allah is exalted in might and wise. Do they await but that Allah should come to them in coverings of clouds and the angels as well? And the matter is then decided, and to Allah all matters are returned. How many times have we actually heard people say that? Uh, very commonly they say, oh, why doesn't God show himself? Why don't the angel show himself? I'm just waiting for something like that to happen. It's just so not necessary to come to a, a just conclusion. Ask the children of Israel how many a sign uh, of evidence we have given them. And whoever exchanges the favor of Allah for disbelief after it has come to him, then indeed Allah is severe in penalty. So it references the children of Israel in particular, and then it talks about exchanging the favor of Allah for disbelief. Again, a transactional thing and a terrible transaction at that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying it would be severe in penalty. Beautiful for, uh, beautified for those who disbelieve is the life of this world. And they ridicule those who believe. But those who fear Allah are above them on the day of resurrection, and Allah gives permission, a provision to whom he wills without account. And it's true, you guys. Look at the things that are put forth right now. You have things like uh, superstardom. You have things like massive amounts of athleticism. You have things that are, you know, all sorts of uh, gizmos and gadgets, cars, fancy houses, all these things. Not saying that you can't have these things and be a believer as well. That's exactly what the Quran encourages you to do, is to go and earn these things in a halal way. Uh, but also saying that there are many of them, many people out there that have gone uh, and earned these things in a non-halal way, and that these glittering, shiny objects are being dangled in front of them, and they're being victims of their own desire uh, for the purposes of seeking out um, this dunya, which is dangerous, right? Uh, mankind, mankind was of one religion before their deviation. So pay close attention to this. This is a bold claim. Mankind was of one religion. Then Allah sent the prophets as bringers of good tidings and warners and sent down with them the scripture in truth to judge between the people concerning that in which they differed. And none differed over it i.e. the scripture, except those who were given it after the clear proofs came to them out of jealous animosity amongst themselves. So here's another characteristic, jealousy. And it's an unhealthy form of jealousy, obviously, as well as animosity. 
and Allah guided those who believed to the truth concerning that over which they had differed by his permission. And Allah guides whom he wills to a straight path. Obviously, we believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the changer of hearts and he's the one that guides. Or do you think that you will be that you will enter paradise while such trial has not yet come to you as came to those who passed on before you? They were touched by poverty and hardship and were shaken until even their messenger and those who believed with him said, when is the help of Allah? Unquestionably, the help of Allah is near. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, if you claim that you believe, he's going to test you. And that is a sign of, uh, of the sincerity that you're going to have. And it's a sign of him receiving your message of you stating that you're going to, that, that you are indeed a believer and you want to be treated as such. So again, it's going to be either a state of gratitude or if it's going to be a state of patience, they ask you, O Muhammad, what, uh, what they should spend, say, whatever you spend of good is to be for parents and relatives and orphans and the needy and the traveler and whatever you do of good. Indeed, Allah is knowing of it. So how should you spend the things that you earn? Uh, which again is, this is money is, is cyclical, right? So you're going to, it's money from God and it's going to go towards either in God's path or it's going to go towards the path of Satan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you how to spend for good. Take care of your parents, take care of your relatives, take care of orphans, take care of the needy. These are all ways in spending for good. Battle has been enjoined upon you while it is hateful to you. But perhaps you hate a thing that is good for you, and perhaps you love a thing and is bad for you, and Allah knows while you know not. So classic arguments of people that are very universalist and spiritual and stuff like that is a little bit of alcohol doesn't really hurt, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. No, um, these there is bad in this, and uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows better than what we know. And even though that it's a trial and a battle within ourselves, we have to follow the rulings because it's not just of what's best for us, but it's also what's best for society and mankind as a whole. Uh, they ask you about the sacred month, about fighting therein. Say, fighting therein, it's a great sin. But uh, averting people from the way of Allah and disbelief in him and preventing access to al-Masjid al-Haram and the expulsion of its people therefrom are greater evils in the sight of Allah. And fitna is greater than killing. And this is once again a repeat of what was what was mentioned previously, because trials and tribulations, especially with something like what's going on right now in Gaza and, and uh, Palestine, you just imagine the condition of somebody who lost all their family. What's the only thing that's on their mind? Probably revenge, anger, you know, and if, you know, all this bent up stuff is going, there's going to be, uh, the, the gasket is going to blow, right? So, and they will continue to fight you until they turn you back from your religion if they are able. And whoever of you revert from his religion to disbelief and dies while he is in, while he is a disbeliever. For those, their deeds have become worthless in this world and the hereafter. And those are the companions of the fire. They will abide therein eternally. And again, this is in reference to the trial and the tribulation and the test that's put forth. Everything from loss of life to loss of wealth, right? So the idea is very simple. If you truly do believe and you believe in the hereafter, um, you are going to pass away as a believer. And I think it's important to make supplication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to pass away in none other than a state of Islam. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that pass away in none other than a state of submission to him. Amin. Indeed, those who have believed and those who have emigrated and fought in the cause of Allah, those expect the mercy of Allah. And Allah is forgiving and merciful. They ask you about wine and gambling. Say, in them is great sin, yet some benefit for people. But their sin is greater than their benefit, and they ask you what they should spend. Say the excess beyond needs, thus Allah makes clear to you the verses of revelation that you might give thought. To this world and the hereafter, and they ask you about orphans, say improvement for them is best. And if you mix your affairs with theirs, they are your brothers. And Allah knows the corrupter from the amender. 
And if Allah had willed, he could have put you in difficulty. Indeed, Allah is exalted in might and wise. And do not marry polytheistic women until they believe. And a believing slave woman is better than a polytheist, even though she might please you. And do not marry polytheistic men to your women until they believe. And a believing slave is better than a polytheist, even though he might please you. Those invite you to the fire, but Allah invites you to paradise and to forgiveness by his permission. And he makes clear his verses, i.e. ordinances to the people that perhaps they might remember. So here's the deal, guys. If you're having any type of relations with people that are uh, polytheists, uh, first and foremost, you're already stepping near Zeno, which is a, a big problem. And um, you really shouldn't be doing anything close to Zina, period. But in re in regards to uh, if you are about to marry a polytheist, it's forbidden, period. Okay. And they ask you about menstruation. Say it is harm, so keep away from the wives during menstruation and do not approach them until they are pure. And when they have purified themselves, then come to them from where Allah has ordained for you. Indeed, Allah loves those who are constantly repentant and loves those who purify themselves. Your wives are a place of cultivation, just a sowing of seed for you. To, so come to your place of cultivation however you wish and put forth righteousness for yourself and fear Allah and know that you will meet him and give good tidings to the believers. So again, here we have this concept of, of marriage and there is a sensitive subject being discussed right here in regards to approaching your wife. But notice that in this same verse, it says, and fear Allah and know that you will meet him. Look, if you mistreat your wife in any single way, you're going to have to answer for that point blank period. Okay. So, you know, use your better judgment hat and don't be a fool. Um, and do not make your oath by Allah an excuse against being righteous and fearing Allah, uh, uh, a righteous and fearing Allah and making peace among people. And Allah is hearing and knowing. So it encourages you to be peacekeepers. Allah does not impose blame upon you for what is unintentional in your oaths, but he imposes blame upon you for what your hearts have earned. And Allah is forgiving and forbearing. For those who swear not to have sexual relations with their wives is a waiting time of four months. But if they return to normal relations, then indeed Allah is forgiving and merciful. And if they decide on divorce, then indeed Allah is hearing and knowing. Divorced women remain in waiting, i.e. do not marry or remarry for three periods. And it is not lawful for them to conceal what Allah has created in their wombs if they believe in Allah in the last day. And their husbands have more right to take them back in this period if they want reconciliation. And due to them, the wives, is similar to what is expected of them according to what is reasonable. But the men, the husbands, have a degree over them in responsibility and authority, and Allah is exalted in, in might and wise. So here you have it. SubhanAllah. You have a guideline on how to reconcile uh, differences that happen within marriage. And no other book will uh, offer this to you, um, especially the step-by-step -step process on what needs to be taken. There's also a waiting period just in case if a, a, a lady is pregnant. So that way that there's no surprises. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages reconciliation. He encourages settling the differences and coming back to uh, what's important, which is that family aspect. And notice this, and due to them, which is the wives, is similar to what is expected of them according to what is reasonable. Look, man, if you're being unreasonable to your wife, you need to get your head right, period. Uh, but the men have a degree over them in responsibility and authority. Yeah, absolutely. We are responsible for our families. We're the protectors. We're the providers. We're the ones that are supposed to be there for them. Um, when they need us the most. And uh, that is an honor that was bestowed upon us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And at the same time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you an exalted, uh, an Allah is exalted in might and wisdom, right? He's exalted in might and wise. Meaning if you think that you're smarter or you're going to do something different or you're going to try to be conniving in any which way, uh, negative. It's not going to work. And if you think that you're stronger than your wife, so you're going to get away with something, 
on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exalted in might, and you're definitely in trouble. Divorce is twice. Then after that, either keep her in an acceptable manner or release her with good treatment. Good treatment. And it is not lawful for you to take anything of what you have given them unless both fear unless both fear that they will not be able to keep within the limits of Allah. But if you fear that they will not keep within the limits of Allah, there is no blame upon either of them concerning that by which uh, she ransoms herself. These are the limits of Allah, so do not transgress them. And whoever transgresses the limits of Allah, it is those who are the wrongdoers, i.e. the unjust. And if he has divorced her for the third time, then she is not lawful to him afterwards until after she marries a husband other than him. And if he, the latter husband, divorces her or dies, there is no blame upon them, uh, i.e. the woman and her former husband, for returning to each other if they think they can keep within the limits of Allah. These are the limits of Allah, which he makes clear to a people who know and have understanding. So there's a step-by-step -step due process, guys. A step-by-step -step due process, and there's ways for uh, ladies to come back to their husbands um, should there should something happen, uh, you know, because there could be kids involved and all of this stuff, all this other stuff. Now, naturally, that's a very very deep subject. I'm not even going to touch that stuff, um, and it definitely requires a scholar. So be sure to consult uh, someone of knowledge in regards to your own personal situation. And when you divorce women, they have nearly fulfilled. Uh, and when you divorce women and they have nearly fulfilled their term, either retain them according to acceptable terms or release them according to acceptable terms and do not keep them intending harm to transgress against them. And whoever does that has certainly wronged himself. And do not take the verse of Allah in jest. And remember the favor of Allah upon you and what has been revealed to you of the book, i.e. the Quran and the wisdom, the Prophet Sunnah, by which he instructs you and fear Allah and know that Allah is knowing of all things. And when you divorce women and they have fulfilled their terms, do not prevent them from remarrying their former husbands if they, all parties, agree amongst themselves on an acceptable basis that is instructed to whoever of you believes in Allah and the last day that is better for you and pure and Allah knows and you know not so again uh, this is the wonderful thing about the flexibility of Islam because it addresses absolutely every situation and it leaves room uh, for um, unique circumstances that can happen between two people, their marriage, kids, no kids, the depth of, of um, and the intricacy of things. But again, consult a scholar on what your personal situation is. And you know, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from having any type of turmoil or tumultuousness within our marriage. I mean, uh, and uh, carrying on, mothers may nurse uh, which is to breastfeed their children two complete years for whoever wishes to complete the nursing period upon the father is their, i.e. the mother's provision and their clothing according to what is acceptable. No person is charged with more than his capacity. No mother should be harmed through her child and no father through his child. And upon the father's heir is a duty like that of the father. And if they both desire weaning through mutual consent from both of them and con consultation, there is no blame upon either of them. And if you wish to have your children nursed by a substitute, there is no blame upon you as long as you give payment according to what is acceptable. And fear Allah and know that Allah is seen of what you do. And those who are taken in death among you and leave wives behind, they, the wives, shall wait four months and ten days, and when they have fulfilled their term, then there is no blame upon you for what they themselves, uh, for what they do with themselves in an acceptable manner, and Allah is fully aware of what you do. There is no blame upon you for that which you indirectly allude concerning a proposal to a woman 
for what you conceal within yourselves. Allah knows that you will have them in mind, but do not promise them secretly except for saying a proper saying, and do not determine to undertake a marriage contract until the decreed period reaches its end. And know that Allah knows what is within yourselves, so be aware of him, and know that Allah is forgiving and forbearing. Now, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but I've seen that there is a pattern happening here, because these are people's um, internal desires and their own unique situations specifically, specifically uh, to what's happening within their hearts. And there is a perpetual reminder that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows what's within your heart, knows what's within your thoughts, and to be cognizant of him. And there's also this theme of being just and being acceptable and being fair and being equitable. And this is another beautiful thing about Islam. There is no blame. This is um, verse 236 where I'm at now. There is no blame upon you if you divorce women you have not touched, nor specified for them an obligation, but give them a gift of compensation. The wealthy according to his capability and the poor according to his capability, a provision according to what is acceptable, a duty upon the doers of good. SubhanAllah, imagine that. So you may have found somebody that you have had an attraction to, but there was no any, uh, any type of um, touching or intercourse or anything like that. So both of you guys have maintained um, your purity. And what do you do? You take the extra step of good, which is to give them some type of a gift and thanking them for the opportunity to get to know them a little bit and telling them, I'm really sorry that it didn't work out, but give them some type of, of a gift or a compensation in what you're capable of doing. Nothing more, nothing less, just things that are acceptable. And if you divorce them before you have touched them and you have already specified for them an obligation, then give half of what you specified. Unless they forego the right of the one. Uh, let me reread that. And if you divorce them before you have touched them and you have already specified for them an obligation, then give half of what you specified. Unless they forego the right or the one in whose hand is the marriage contract forgoes it. And to forego it is nearer to righteousness and do not forget graciousness between you indeed a law of whatever you do is seen so if you forego the gift so imagine this it's a gesture in kind it's a gesture in kind you're being a kind person you're saying here's a here's a parting gift and if you forego this gift especially if you're the one that holds the contract meaning it's encouraging you to not take advantage of people simply because of a contractual basis. Rather, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, it is more righteous for you, nearer to righteousness, right? On that scale, on that spectrum of righteousness, to forget um, and forego the uh, contractual obligations and not to be forgetful of graciousness between you. And again, there's a, a reminder, indeed, Allah of whatever you do is seen. You know, it's... It's just such a beautiful thing. Maintain with care the obligatory prayers, and in particular the middle, asa prayer, and stand before Allah devoutly obedient. And if you fear an enemy, then pray on foot or riding. But when you are secure, then remember Allah in prayer as he has taught you that which you did not know. And those who are taken in death among you and leave wives behind for their wives is a bequest maintenance for one year without turning them out but if they leave of their own accord then there is no blame upon you for what they have for what they do with themselves in an acceptable way and Allah is exalted in might and wisdom and for divorced women uh, and for divorced women is a provision according to what is acceptable a duty upon the righteous meaning you can't just leave somebody hanging right uh, instead of like the modern day court battles and trying to figure out, you know, fighting over custody of children and doing all this other stuff. And I've given, I understand people's circumstances are very unique and emotions are charged and people are polarized and stuff like that. So I want to be respectful to people's um, unique circumstances, but just know in the Quran, if there is a, if there is a divorce, then there is a 
uh, a provision that should be provided to uh, to the woman. Okay. Thus, Allah makes clear to you his verses or laws that you might use reason. So use your reason through all this stuff. Have you not considered those who left their homes in many thousands fearing death? Allah said to them, die. Then he restored them to life. Indeed, Allah is the possessor of bounty for the people. But most of the people do not show gratitude. <clears throat> so he's looking for a quality of you. He's looking for a sincerity. He's looking for you to show gratitude. How do you show gratitude? By following the laws, following the rules, being respectful of the things, the limitations that he has laid forth. And fight in the cause of Allah and know that Allah is hearing and knowing. Who is it that would loan Allah a goodly loan so he may multiply it for him many times over? And it is Allah who withholds and grants abundance and to him you will be returned. Have you not considered the assembly of the children of Israel after the time of Moses, when they said to a prophet of theirs, send to us a king and we will fight in the way of Allah? He said, would you perhaps refrain from fighting if battle was prescribed for you? They said, and why should we not fight in the cause of Allah when we have been driven out from our homes and from our children? But when battle was prescribed for them, they turned away, except for a few of them, and Allah is knowing of the wrongdoers. And their prophet said to them, Indeed, Allah has sent to you Saul as a king. They said, How can he have kinship over us, a kingship over us, while we are more worthy of kingship than him? And he has not been given any measure of wealth. So again, they're trying to determine, they're trying to use wealth and kingship and this type of authority. He said, indeed, Allah has chosen him over you and has increased him abundantly in knowledge and stature. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevates whom he wills. And Allah gives his sovereignty to whom he wills. And Allah is all-encompassing in favor and knowing. And their prophet said to them, indeed, a sign of his kingship is that the chest will come to you in which is assurance from your Lord and a remnant of what the family of Moses and the family of Aaron had left carried by the angels, indeed, and that is a sign for you, if you are believers. <clears throat> and when Saul went forth with the soldiers, he said, indeed, Allah will be testing you with a river. So whoever drinks from it is not of me, and whoever does not taste it is indeed of me, excepting one who takes from it in the hollow of his hand. So there's a limitation, right? Don't, don't, you know, just chug a bunch of the river water. Uh, rather, you could take what's hollow uh, of, of your hand. But they drank from it, except a very few of them. Then when he had crossed it along with those who believed with him, they said, there is no power for us, power for us today against Goliath and his soldiers. But those who were certain that they would meet Allah said, how many a small company has overcome a large company by permission of Allah? And Allah is with the patient. So again, this is a mindset. The mindset here is that if you think that you need some type of a special gadget or gizmo or circumstance, uh, you're wrong. All that you need is faith in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, utilizing your reason and putting your trust and faith into him while you're still conducting the actions yourself. There were still actions that needed to be conducted by these people, such as following the messenger, not drinking more than their fill from the river, committing over to the battlefield from the get-go, and not tucking tail and running, right? Not creating excuses. So as you're going through life and you're dealing with um, circumstances, whether it be job circumstances or anything like that, you still have to do the work. You can't just sit there and be like, oh, I'm going to pray five, five, 10, 20 times a day, and I'm going to let, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala take care of my problems for me. No. Faith is just a component, and the action is, is another major component. So, And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah is with the patient. And when they went forth to face Goliath and his soldiers, they said, Our Lord, pour upon us patience and plant firmly our feet and give us victory over the disbelieving people. So they defeated them by permission of Allah. And David killed Goliath, and Allah gave him the kingship and wisdom, which is the prophethood. 
and taught him from that which he willed. And if it were not for Allah checking some people by means of others, the earth would have been corrupted. But Allah is the possessor of bounty for the worlds. These are the verses of Allah which we recite to you, O Muhammad, in truth. And indeed, you are from among the messengers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Okay, so we've reached the end of the juz. That's the conclusion of the second juz. If there's any guests that want to uh, come up here, now is a wonderful time to come up here and ask um, or share any thoughts. Uh, I will just share one more thing here, which is uh, oftentimes when we're talking to people um, and there's a question of, you know, why did God do this or why did God do that? Or how is this test fair? And here is an answer for you. First off, if you look at the thread of what's happening here, the good people are the minority and the bad people, meaning like typically the ones that are causing the big problems and the big corruption are usually the majority. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us right here that if it weren't for Allah checking some people by means of others, so the, the small minority that is upon faith and upon righteousness and firm and they're eliminating the corruption um then this earth would have just been keeled over so for all these people that are under the impression that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is just letting things happen uh no it's not the case rather it's the opposite that he's keeping the corruption in check with righteous people and he encourages you to be one of those righteous people to join the ranks and to stop the corruption that's happening on this planet whether that be the misuse of resources the disrespect of the planet itself, the disbelief in the existence of God, which is most important, because again, if they believed, then there would be no corruption, period. And by belief, I mean truly believe, not some of this hypocritical stuff and whatnot. Anyway, um, anything that I have said, again, I apologize. Uh, it's a mistake from me and Shaitan and uh, Prophet Muhammad wasalam, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are free from uh, any errors and mistakes. So uh, thank you so much for your patience with me while I read this juz. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa Habibina Muhammad wa ala ali wa sahabina Muhammad. Um, so barakallahu um, feek again and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'll see you guys tomorrow, inshallah.